Jim Joyce. We got it. Another week done, man. <laughs> Another week. <laughs> Another week I'm, I'm looking forward to when we hit our 50th episode. Can you believe it? Like, um, dude, I, to be honest, I, I don't know, but it's somewhere in the 40s. Uh, I'm looking now uh, as we're... Um, as we're talking, but how, how's your week been so far? And as I'm looking this up, oh geez, like I had one of those weeks. I, I you know, I know we didn't catch up on Monday, but I um, know, I know. I, you know bad. I had, you know, all the drama and trauma of entrepreneurism <laughs> baked into my first couple of days. I had a, you know, I had a, a much beloved client kind of move on, you know, just because of where they're at with their medicine, and I had a new client sign on so um okay I yeah, mean, so that's... i'm ready i'm ready for a little chill conversation uh with uh you know our guest i guess yeah that's how I'm feeling, you know? awesome yes same and it's been a heck of a week already and not even close yet but uh hey that's we we, we choose this life of uh <laughs> entrepreneurship right uh the yep. ups and downs uh i do have to uh just I don't know, like uh, we were looking for some DNO insurance uh, for your coach, right? And I just tweeted it out. And so yeah. quick shout out to Joe Connolly, by the way, yeah. um, uh, mbroker.com. I'm not like, by the way, people are watching, not getting paid by them. I just thought it was <laughs> such a smooth, smooth yeah. experience versus the old school, like going through brokers and stuff. So uh, yeah. I don't know, just I, you for, know, for the entrepreneurs that are watching. The deal, I, I was just actually, Health Excels in Clubhouse right now or something today. I don't know if you, did you go into it? I just hopped on, we, we just finished 15 minutes ago. So uh, yeah, that was fun. Okay, okay, yeah, no, I didn't That was time. my first time in Clubhouse this week, by the way. I kind of, I don't know, just haven't really had the time, so. It's kind of intense and I, I find it quite intense. So, you know, I kind of like check in as I'm sitting on the couch and I'm like, I'm not sure I'm ready to be a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> or like you know yeah it all depends on when right you're getting sort of pinged in and it's like oh you know i'm just kind of using this as a radio right now but i honestly i haven't been i just went back to um uh, uh, to podcasts right yeah. uh, and or actually on spotify i'm listening to um uh, atomic habits now the full book audio book so uh, i'm just oh, listening lovely. to it lovely. as i walk but at 1.8 time speed yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get through it quick <laughs> that's my new habit is listening it? Yeah, at yeah. almost two x speed that's awesome. Anywho, I think um, the, the deal the deal of the week before we let it um yeah. i i thought was the achille therapeutics deal we didn't they announce like that they got a 20 million dollar investment from a japanese uh, oh, I did. I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm having them in. That's how busy the week has been. I saw, um, you know, pair closed off their, their extra 20. Um, you know, it was, it was okay. always announced as a hundred K a hundred uh, mil deal, but I think they just topped it off with a 20, but I, I didn't see the Achille one, to be honest. Um, uh, that's, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I thought that was interesting. So it looks like the company that they, they you know, I, I just kind of heard this, I'm not sure where I've heard this even, but, um, that, that, the company that's investing them is going to kind of get the rights to market their product in the Japanese market. So I thought that was really unique because you don't hear like, I mean, we're just maybe not close to it, but um, you don't hear a lot of Japanese digital health deals kind of making it back into kind of the Western system we're playing. Well, I mean, look at Atsuka, right? I mean, they were early on uh, as well. Um, and, you know, just bought the assets, right? Um, yeah. But anyway, I see uh, I see our guest is probably anxiously waiting uh, in okay. in the room. So this is um, I I've come across uh, Andre Blackman many times before back in New York. Uh, but it was one of those things that like we saw each other maybe in somewhere in the room, never really got to chat. Uh, so this will be a little bit of the experiment. And then Carlos, I, I actually reached out to Andre a while back, and then Carlos uh, shamed him. But let me let let's let him in. Let's let him in. Great. I look forward to meeting him. I, I, I don't think I've met Andre if I have. Let's see if we're let's see. there. He okay. is. Oh. You, wait, we're going to have to do the famous you're on mute line. <laughs> you, you know what has to happen. You know <laughs> what's going on, guys? Hey, what's Andre, going on? Uh, Andre, do we have, have we met before? At, I don't think so. I mean, like my, okay. my brain is so like fuzzy from like post. <laughs> 2020. I mean, I, I was definitely heavy on the conference circuit for a long time uh, yeah. over the past. Wait, post 2020? I thought it was still 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, the 14th, 15th month of 2020. Um, yeah. 
but no, I mean, like I, I, you know, I, I bowed out, you know, for a couple years after my, my daughter was born and at the end of uh, 2016. Um, but yeah, I'm just really okay. excited to, to go out. So, to and, and, and you and I we were just, you know, we usually do a few minutes before we let our awesome yeah. guests in. Um, yeah. We were just sort of started to reminisce. Like we've run each other, like I think on, online back in New York City days, but like, I think, I don't think we've ever spent like, quality time let's put it that way it was like on the other side of the room somewhere to meet up or something exactly and then, you know i just happened to reach out and then carlos like out of old the old place just happened to also mention you on the on on the podcast so i, sh I shamed yeah. you uh, via <laughs> via carlos publicly thank you thank you I, I i needed it man like it's been a it's been a wild uh past year for sure um and i'll, I'll get into this like you know yeah, obviously yeah. 2020 but um but yeah, man, I'm really looking forward to just kind but of connecting, why, reconnecting, all that kind of stuff. Why don't you tell our viewers and listeners who you are and what's your story? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so Andre Blackman, founder and CEO of Onboard Health. Uh, my entire career has been uh, around public health, healthcare innovation, the social terms of health. Um, you know, as far as like my story, it's uh, it's a really kind of a, a non-traditional uh, convoluted way th that I got into this space, but, you know, grew up as a nerd, um, you know, just kind of really interested in, um, you know, kind of science and tech, um, you know, had my, my chemistry sets moment where uh, smoke was coming out the house um, and really just kind of went down the pathway, you know, went to University of Maryland for aerospace engineering, um, did some high school internships at Walter Reed, um, at NASA, really thought I was going to be, you know, kind of like that kind of that aerospace person, uh, took a course in college around uh, epidemiology and really learned about how, you know, tuberculosis was adversely affecting the African American community. And so I'm like sitting over here, coming back from like an engineering class, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, didn't we get rid of tuberculosis like 5,000 years ago? Right. Start asking some more questions that pulled me into public health, switched my major, and went all in. Um, and so, you know, for the past 15 plus years, um, really have been trying to figure out, um, you know, the, the public health space, health disparities, health inequities, uh, but also another foot in technology and innovation. And so um, yeah. 2007 was when I started writing at Pulse and Signal. That was the blog um, that I got started went back when I was still in DC, um, really looking at the intersection of social media. This is when social media was just mm -hmm. getting hot, getting started. So it's kind of part of the, the OG uh, social media landscape, part of the, the first year that Twitter came out, I was already on it. You, you need to get on Ritesh's and Kyle's show. I don't know if you know Ritesh. Uh, uh, they're doing like the OG of social media and healthcare show every week, I think, too. So I'll, oh, I'll, wow. I'll, I'll, hook, I'll hook you up. I don't, I, I don't know if you, if, if you like be accepted in there, but I, <laughs> I have no idea. We'll, 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 we'll get you cooked up with Ritesh and Kyle. Are you calling us from DC or New York or where you um, So I'm in North Carolina now. So I moved okay. from, from DC probably about a decade ago um, to kind of get back to healthcare, you know, like Research Triangle Park um, has a whole lot of that kind of like, you know, bioscience, pharma kind of piece. I worked at RTI International okay. um, and that sort of thing too. But yep, I'm in North Carolina. And in, in, in like, so after researching all the social determinants of health, like what, 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 have, you, what have you figured out that the rest of us haven't figured out? Um, and, and sorry, can yeah. I add one more thing to that gym statement? Because yeah. just, you know, I, I hear it all the time in the VC community and in innovation, it becomes this buzzword that, you know, everybody's using as DOH, as DOH, yeah. as DOH, right? Without, yeah. I think, and you explain it better, um, real recognizing what that actually means, right? It just, yeah. it becomes this buzzword. So please, sorry, I wanted to add that because I just... I'm getting annoyed by the fact that everybody's overusing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, coming from public health, I mean, this is what we've been talking about for decades. So this is nothing new. Um, and and there's, there's a narrative there around like public health and like traditional health care. And now that there's this kind of like gray space, uh, who's been co-opting what, right? And who's been able to like put something, you know, at the forefront, how to popularize something, how to make it sexy, all that kind of good stuff. Meanwhile, this has been around, this is what public health is, right? Unfortunately, right. public health really sucks at telling its own narrative. Um, and traditionally, you know, the, the leaders in public health are really excited to be in the shadows and be the, in, the invisible shield. Um, unfortunately, like nobody knows what the hell that means. And so funding, 
attention, uh, trust, um, all kind of get convoluted and go down the drain. So to, to, to put it like really clearly, I mean, the social determinants of health are essentially all the different things that happen outside of the hospital, outside of the spaces that actually create, um, you know, the conditions that we have uh, for healthy or unhealthy lives, right? And so the other layer to that is, is oftentimes people, you know, say it as like where we live, work and play, right? So I'm sure mm -hmm. you both know who Jane Sirson Khan is. Um, yeah. This is like her narrative, right? Like how, what are the different things that happen um, in our everyday lives that actually have an impact on our health and well-being? Um, so that was kind of how SDOH has been, you know, played, you know, in, in our spaces around, you know, healthcare and medicine, you know, you see a lot of hospitals now buying up, you know, the surrounding kind of, you know, buildings. Johns Hopkins was really kind of, you know, um, doing that um, quite a bit um, in order to like extend and have some insight on what's happening in their communities, um, especially as a switch to like value-based care became really popular. So, you know, the right. social determinants are really, you know, where we live, work and play, how poverty plays a role in it. Um, and now, you know, especially after last year, um, health equity is at the forefront of everything now um, right. and it's different than disparities and things of that nature and you know you really get into a lot of the systemic aspects of um, of healthcare now so um, that, that's, you, that's what it is when you saw this like when you kind of opening up saying like hey, you know you looked into tuberculosis and you see that you know African Americans had a disproportionate you know um, you know you're like didn't this condition you know why do we even have this condition at all like yeah. it, you know I mean, have you, like, when you, when you looked at this, is there something that's surprised from researching and looking at, is there something that's like surprised you, you know, like everyone, you know, from the outside, you kind of, you know, I don't know, I look at it and say, okay, poverty, uh, you know, underlying, you know, kind of social inequities, you know, all those things, it's quite obvious that that would have a huge impact on health, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, is there something that like kind of surprised you as you research it? Is there something under the hood that would kind of shock people or... Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on like who you ask, James, right? I mean, like a lot of people, you know, and, 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 and me included, right? Like we grow up um, seeing certain kind of professions being like the holy grails of certain things, right? Like, do you want to be a doctor, a lawyer or an astronaut, right? Like we get those kind of different questions. Um, right. Like medicine and, and, um, and doctors have been held in high regard forever, right? For a very long time. And so oftentimes, you know, you, um, and this plays out in like health literacy, like how, how much you trust your physician, like, you know, without asking any kind of questions, yep. um, those kind of things. But none of it really shocked me once I started to get a little bit deeper into public and community health. Um, yep. and just kind of looking at those underlying, you know, and, and you know, if, if you even take some time to even just ask a few questions, you'll see there's, you know, a, a huge layer of inequity, but also like systemic racism and things of that nature, right? Mm -hmm. How right. you, how like physicians, um, kind of learn about communities and things of that nature. I mean, just a few years ago, right, like the Dell School of Medicine, like kind of changed the paradigm on like their school of medicine and how they raise doctors. They have to actually like become part of the community. They actually have to like tackle these, um, these other kind of aspects about like community health and, and impact um, in order to like move forward, right? And yeah. so, you know, none of that really surprised me once I started learning and talking to a lot of my professors um, and that just opened up the next web of what other conditions and diseases um, that oftentimes, you know, it's, it, it became status quo that you like the yep. scroll open up like, you know, um, underrepresented communities, you know, are suffering from asthma, heart disease, <laughs> diabetes, and it was just like, hey, it just is what it is, right? No, right. like it's not right. is what it is, right? There's specific reasons for it. And we saw right. a lot of that happen in 2020 when, you know, the pandemic came out and you really saw like the cracks in a lot of the system that came out. In, you know, I think also the inter, some of the interventions, especially, you know, I mean, we've all been sort of tracking digital, right, uh, mm -hmm. are different. Uh, you know, my, uh, Marina and I, um, uh, for your coach research, we went out on the streets of Washington Heights, New York, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to find out like, um, you know, do people even know what a health coach is, right? So in more affluent neighborhoods, people do, right? And uh, we, we just happened to stop one guy who was really walking fast. So we actually felt kind of rude, just like, you know, uh, falling him over. He had like something on his chest and he went into the story where he was diagnosed with diabetes. And, you know, he started talking about, yeah, well, I can't afford like a fancy phone to track all my stuff. So I got myself a $5 pedometer and he's just competing with himself, right? And oh, it was nice. such a heartening thing, but like we think about access 
but think about all of these digital tools that entrepreneurs are pushing. That's also different interventions can be in different areas, right? So yeah, I mean, and 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 that's like the that that's the landscape now that like pulled that honestly like made me pull away from a lot of like the shiny like health care innovation kind of stuff because at the end of the day you know you can't build on top of a hot mess right like if there's actually like the root of a lot of things like you know literacy and like you know better communications like you know if that's still like you know garbage <laughs> like you know adding another kind of app or whatever is not going to change access to better care it's not going to change you know yeah. um you know stigmas related like one of the big things that happened uh, a couple of years ago was right like serena williams and her pregnancy right and that was just like a great showcase, like no matter who you are, especially as a black woman in the United States, like, you know, the, the maternal mortality rates um, are not in their favor, right? And, and there's right. reasons for that, right? So like no kind of app or whatever, or like technology or portal is going to change like what happens in that moment, right? Like that whole stigma around like, you know, black women could probably take more pain, right? So we're not going to like prescribe this, or we're not going to listen to like what they're saying, like, all those kind of things are is what, what we talk about when it comes to like systemic um, issues related to healthcare. And so, you know, we can talk about, you know, all the different kind of tools, but, you know, at the end of the day, like this is something that Susanna Fox, you know, who like I absolutely love and everybody yeah. kind of referred to her speaking of the golden age, right? Like everybody looked at her <laughs> few stuff, yeah. like any kind of presentation, right? But basically that kind of cracked open this whole thing around the digital divide and like who uses right. what and access or whatever and, and mobile tech. So, you know, yeah. those are the kind of different conversations that are still like plaguing this area, right? Like who doesn't use technology? Well, actually, no, that's, that's not, that's not true. Like, right. Like, no, so no. getting granular is, is super important too. Like I, I saw, we would, I was just looking at something like our, um, my company's product. Um, you know, we're doing, we're doing something where our, our tool is being used in say diabetes, uh, in actually in, uh, in pregnancy. Uh, and, and we're for tracking injections that women have to take if they're at high risk. And, and so this whole health, health equity issue, but we, anyway, looking into it, you know, we were thinking about pricing of the service. And so we started looking into like other services. So you take like the, like the diabetes services that, you know, you guys are probably expert in, in thinking about. So, you know, great companies, Amada's, Lavongo, um, you know, Dexacom, like all these phenomenal services, but the price of some of those services in the U S are, 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 are quite expensive. Like you're talking, five, 6,000 a year for, you know, for, for, you know, certain types of, you know, um, you know, maybe not the Lavango service, but the Dexacom services and, you know, expensive, monitored, effective, cost-effective, all those reasons. But, you know, that implies it's probably not going to, or, you know, like the, in even trusting those services or whatever, there's probably a good chance that they're being distributed to people with It's not going to reach everyone. It's yeah. It's not going to reach yeah. everyone. Just yeah. just before this, we were uh, well. I was in the clubhouse with the Health Excel team, and we were actually talking about digital therapeutics, right? Um, yep. And the example that we made, uh, you know, Jim, you kicked off the discussion earlier on Achilles, right? So Achilles is a great example of well, it's a game you play for ADHD. And uh, Tim Young was on with us, uh, pharmacist, and one of the things I kind of said, well, look. Um, what about access to all of this, right? Because, you know, is it going to get reimbursed? Because the Achilles, I don't remember the pricing off of it, but it's not cheap, right? If you pay out of pocket. Right. And so Tim's comment was, well, great. Um, uh, the more affluent consumers will be able to pay for it because then they would rather have their child do Achilles for ADHD than taking a drug. And so like thinking back actually about the promise of digital, right? Um, the reality is there's still a digital divide now. Because yeah. same, same thing with those tools. Um, so, I mean, we just kept going with a couple of these examples right off the bat, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just super important to just kind of understand like, like who's in the room when these products and services are being created. And then this, this gets into like what we're building at Onboard Health and, and things of that nature from like a leadership perspective, right? Um, there's a lot of fallacies. There's a lot of stigma when it comes to this. I remember years back at the first, first Health Data Palooza event in DC, seeing Chris Hogue for the first time, like we've been connected for a long time, but getting a chance to like rub shoulders, like, you know, John Brown scene when he was still doing like health map at that point. But like one of the conversations I had with Chris is about like product. And this is like, you know, kind of like this, the phase two of a lot of like the health 2.0 health innovation landscape, but also just learning about how products are created. Like who's in the room, who's creating the yep. products, where are the insights coming from? How do we like squash a lot of the fallacies? 
and he was very transparent as far as like you know we we, we want to look at like the early adopters people who have like the money and all this kind of other stuff right and so like that's right. another key po- point about oftentimes like you know at that point where products kind of skew incorrectly but then you know you can't once again you like you can't build off of that like once you're down the line it's like oh well actually we want to get this in the hands of yeah you know so and so um oftentimes it's too late and so that's what we're trying to mitigate with you know um the work we're doing at, at onboard health but i mean there's so much that goes into this um so i'm so glad that so, that we're able so to tell us yeah tell us more about onboard when did you start it what i mean i i, I can obviously tell the passion but just uh yeah. kind of what was the trigger to start it and what are you guys doing there yeah, I mean, great question. I mean, like, once again, everything has just been kind of like moving toward alignment, right? And so, you know, started Pulse and Signal and turned that into a, cons- a consultancy around digital strategy. And I had this pivotal moment in 2016 where I got invited back to my alma mater, School of Public Health at University of Maryland, to give the commencement address. And like, you know, the year before I was the Surgeon General. So I was like, are y'all sure you want me to, to give the commencement address? But, you know, the whole purpose was oh, like, man. I would yeah, love to. Just- Is it on YouTube? It, I'll send you all the link. I mean, basically, um, there's an article that I wrote, like why I started Onboard Health. I'll send that to y'all because the, the nine minute video is linked inside of there. And so it's like a nine minute commencement. And I really just kind of talk about, you know what, like, you know, take some time to travel, see how people live, how, how they work, um, because like the future of health um, is going to change really quickly. So like public health has a lot of like prevention aspects and all that kind of good stuff. But like we're living in a time now where things are iterating and changing so fast. Um, that you need to have like some insight on like behavioral psychology, right? And we're, mm-hmm. lo and behold, like, you know, we're seeing behavioral health, like being the kind of space where a lot of, you know, investment is being made. So yep. long story short, gave the commencement address, was so energized, but also I started thinking about what the workforce was going to need to A, look like in order to like see this kind of coming convergence of the social determinants, public health, traditional medicine and healthcare, and what it was going to need to be equipped better with, Right. And so once again, going back to this narrative that like, if we want things to be sustainable, uh, if we're seeing things going into the behavioral, you know, health landscape, we're seeing mental health, chronic disease, food sustainability, right? All these kind of different things and companies are, are being built to like, you know, um, to apply to it. Um, but the teams aren't representative of the communities that, um, that a lot of these products and services are serving. And so for me, it only made sense that we start to equip the workforce um, and, and turn into like more of an ecosystem um, to really kind of say like, hey, it's not about, you know, a pipeline issue that there aren't certain people not in data science. It's how do we, you know, best find people um, that are representative, right? And that are in data science, engineering, um, UX, human experience design, those kinds of places. And so that's how everything got started. And this was at the end of 2016, um, you know, when I started thinking about this and 2017 just turned it into just like everything else, like a newsletter, start building the community, and then yep. fast forward to, you know, 2020, um, you know, or 2019, after um, actually Carlos <laughs> was part of the, um, the Onboard Health um, Aspen Ideas Fellows that oh. I brought on to the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, and like, he got us to climb a mountain. It was crazy. And like, it, like at the crack of dawn. <laughs> um, but, you know, essentially, like right after that, Dr. Aletha Maybank, you know, who's a former health commissioner of New York City, reached out to me, heard about what I was doing with Onboard Health. She just became the first chief health equity officer at the American Medical Association to build their very first center for health equity. She's like, Andre, I want you to help me build my team. Boom. Awesome. Like after I picked my mouth up off the floor, we got to work. And that's how that kind of transformed into Onboard Health being an executive search and talent strategy um, firm for companies building the future of health. And we're still growing our, our talent community as well. So you help like kind of get people on the team to have it be more representative, more, you know, like health equity focused or, you know, am I missing it? Like to, to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Jim. I mean, you know, essentially, you know, we're, we're helping to build a more diverse and inclusive workforce ecosystem to power the future of health. So for companies like, you know, venture backed startups, larger cap organizations, venture funds that have portfolios and have an ecosystem, basically, you know, now there's a, a resource uh, to really kind of get rid of that whole thing about like, we don't know where to find, you know, A, B, and C. Um, right. And so essentially we do executive search, um, usually director level and above uh, for companies uh, who are building the future of health um, and making sure that, uh, you know, on, on one hand, finding the right kinds of people and presenting them for roles. And then on the other hand, really kind of doing that internal capacity building and understanding 
how to do things more inclusively um, around hiring and retention and that sort of thing. And how have you found, how, how have you found 2020? <laughs> Ooh, fellas, I mean, wow. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> now, now we're going to get into it, y'all. I haven't, so, let, uh, I haven't let up on them. I'm just hitting them with questions. Like, but, <laughs> but, but, but you know, yeah. the reason you're talking to us is because of 2020 also. Because yeah. we started this because of freaking 2020. Yeah, I mean, like the pandemic, you know, just kind of obliterated everybody's plans. It threw everything <laughs> into just like this kind of like chaotic landscape, right? Um, and obviously, you know, um, you know, the aspect of, um, I missed that, sorry. <laughs> um, no, it was, we, so this is a, um, you know, the free zone. You're not supposed to say the words pandemic, COVID, C-19. So we, we just hold up like makeshift signs of C-19. But don't worry about it, we say it all but the time. But don't worry about it, we say it all the time anyway. And it's not like we, you know, technically we should drink every time somebody says it, but we don't, but we just drink North anyway, Carolina, so. Literally. Right. Yeah, this, this is like largely, like this, the whole genesis, which we say every week almost is like, is a, is a counseling therapeutic session for Eugene and myself. So we just like to meet people that kind of, we, we're kind of sucking your energy and your enthusiasm for the world. Yeah, we're the man, energy man. vampires every Wednesday. That's what it is. <laughs> Tell me, like, we, we need it, y'all. We need it, like, in this day and age. Like, there's just so much stuff just, like, you know, kind of crumbling. But there's a lot of bright spots, too. And, you know, I, I'm trying to stay optimistic in a lot of different ways. <laughs> but, you know, 2020, the intersection of, you know, you know, disease, um, just kind of like, you know, collapse from like what, so, you know, poor leadership, uh, just like across the board. Um, and then, you know, looking at racial injustice, right? So after like the, the George Floyd murder, like that really signaled not yeah. only like, okay, like maybe we should start paying attention to this kind of piece now around like racial injustice and like racism, um, but yeah. then obviously it got into the workplace, right? So as, you know, as people start questioning about like, you know, um, you know, what do our teams look like um, as like, you know, more and more narratives around, um, you know, kind of, you know, Black Lives Matter and th things of that nature, but ultimately like, where are we going in this country if this is happening, right? Um, and how does that reflect like on what we're doing? Like we, we go to work and work is a huge part of our lives, right? So naturally it went into the boardroom and the workplace and that's what really kind of hit an inflection point for us at Onboard Health because we've been at the intersection of yeah. the future of health, the future of work with this lens on, on equity and inclusion. But you know, you know, other than that, from a public health lens, like as soon as the virus hit the Southern parts of the country, right? Where traditionally yeah. there's inequities and disparities boom you saw mortality rates start to skyrocket all the different kind of like cracks in our system yep. um got exposed, exposed. like exposed. you could yep. not yep you could not keep of, that on there as a leader like in the space and you know having set up a company you know tackling this area it seems like you know like health equity and public public health right like you you became a rock star in 2020 right like you know <laughs> like you know it's like you know went from like hey what are you up to oh yeah that sounds interesting to like like we need public health people, we need health equity people, but yeah. like it is um. Dude, this is why he didn't respond to me at first until I shamed him publicly. So he's yeah. just too much of a rock star. <laughs> but did you? Yeah, like you know, it's like, but 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 were you stressed? Were, did you get yourself wrapped up in it? Were you like doom scrolling online and and you know, it, or were you able to kind of like sit back and have a kind of a bird's eye view of what was going on in twenty twenty? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel like, you know, sitting back was definitely not a phrase that I would, that I would say, like, you know, last year. <laughs> I don't know year. who it, I mean, did. I, it, I honestly, like, I don't think it, it's human to just sit back when yeah. it, yeah. something like that. Yeah, did. but I mean, I like, don't know. even in the light of just, like, to be completely honest, fellas, like, you mean, like, it, it grew me up as well, right? Like, throughout my whole career, like, in Hell 2.0 and whatnot, like, I was always, like, the agreeable, nice person that everybody knew and all this kind of other stuff. Um, and like, that was, that was, you know, that worked for me for a lot of different ways. Um, but then like in 2020, like it was a reckoning on like, okay, like, I, I don't know if we can like curse here, but like, I was like, this shit has to end. Like, I, and, I market yeah. child proof. <laughs> okay, <whatever>. great. <laughs> so it's all good. <laughs> but I was like, all right, Andre, like how the hell are you going to be showing up this year and beyond now? Right. Like, right. you know, it, it, it's one of those kind of things like where, once again, like back in like 2012, I wrote something called like the Sustainer Die Manifesto, like the rise of public health 2.0, how like the whole industry of public health is going to die. And also the people that have been charged to be helped 
are going to be dying. And like, here we are a number of years later, like more people are still dying in the streets. I'm not sure if y'all saw the movie or the documentary, um, The Interrupters, but I would definitely put no. that on the list. Um, basically, um, Gary Slutkin really ascribe like, you know, an epidemiology kind of approach to like crime and look and kind of like, you know, did a parallel between like crime and um, kind of like, like, you know, homicide, particularly in Chicago um, to a public health model. And basically the mm -hmm. whole documentary is looking at the community impact and things of that nature. I think RWJF was like behind that too, but it's a real eye opener wow. on like, still years later, here we are, right? So right. for me, like it was definitely one of those moments where I, I felt it, um, I was galvanized by it, and then it kicked me into action as far as like, you know, kind of really kind of bringing um, the right kind of lens to like, what can I do right now? And let's, yep. let's get started. Yep. And did you find, were you able to, man I mean, were you, you seem like you're pretty good at managing stress. Were you stressed or were you... I mean, I'll tell you what, like as a, as a black man in America, like, I mean, I had my moments, right? Like it was one of those kind of narratives where like the work that I've been doing for a long time around things like public health and, and knowing about, you know, inequities and how this is really kind of impacting and shaping a lot of different things, but also like as a father, like, you know, now like that, that hit me home. So like, yeah. I think this is when I really start delving into like mental health, right? Like growing up as like, you know, uh, you know, son of immigrants, like my, my mom is from Trinidad, my dad's from Jamaica, right? Like this whole thing about like mitigating stress was just like, hey, you know, it is what it is. You keep it moving, right? right, right, um, right. But this, this- I, really I also think it's a generational thing because I, I think no matter whose parents you talk to that, at least even like, you know, I'm from Ukraine and same thing. Yeah. It's like, you just, just keep rolling with it, right? Like- Yeah, like, yeah. Like you'll figure it out. Like, you know, yeah. keep it. And, and, you know, part of that is, it has worked in my favor, right? Like that kind of grit and resilience kind of piece. Um, but I think like last year, it, 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 be, it, it became like um, normalized, which is a good thing around mental health. And this is when we were talking about, you know, like behavioral health really mm -hmm. skyrocketed. People are at home. You know, a lot of things that don't get met um, in like the mainstream, especially like in our industry of health innovation, like what happened last year, right? Like, you know, the pandemic put a lot of people at home, but then like domestic violence and partner like abuse like skyrocketed, right? That's a right. public health issue, right? Yeah. And so I think there's there's a lot of stuff like even as a smoke is clearing from 2020, like we're not we're not going to know like the full extent of this stuff no. for, for a long time. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think like I'd love to like like the take. Sorry, Eugene, I just it's fascinating subject. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I, chilling. I, 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 I see you're drinking too, by the way, right? I know it's a little too early for you, Andre, <laughs> but I guess it's never you know. But no, I mean I. <laughs> It's 8 oh, p.m. here, 7 p.m. By, yeah. by Jimbo. So this this whole this whole like I'm in Dublin, I'm, uh, but this this whole um, concept of like you know what happens early in life, right? Like you know that you know the idea that we've taken these kids out of school last year, you know, like they didn't have like so they're you know like I was thinking about like you know we live in um we, you know we had I, I you know I live in Dublin I live in Dublin Ireland and we've just gotten like our backyard done or something like that, you know and. And so other, you know, we're kind of in an urban area. If we didn't have a backyard, like I'm not sure we would have made it through, you know. <laughs> right. but, you know, like, you know like it's like, but imagine if you're in a, you know, you're living in Manhattan and you're in, you know, uh, you know, a two bedroom apartment with five people or something yep. like or that. Or a studio with three, right? I like it just yeah, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean that, that was another aspect, and that's that's social determinants, right? Like the built environment, you know, cityscapes, walkable cities, all those kind of different things you know, that's what has thrusted a lot of this stuff into the spotlight, you know, but I think that mental health kind of landscape is, is what's really going to like showcase like what, what we've seen yeah. uh, for sure. But I mean, like last year, like, and on the flip side, right? Like we got some really great people to work with that are like, okay, we know this is, this is going to be work to actually like look from the inside out from our companies, because it's not just about like, Hey, can you help us like hire like an underrepresented person or like a black or brown individual like I turned down a lot of that last year as well, because I was like, that's not, that, that's, that's, um, you know, um, it's like a bandaid, but also, right. Like it perpetuates what we're, what we're talking about, right. Th tossing somebody into a chaotic or yeah. toxic environment, right. Like, you know, continues to perpetuate what's going on. And so like, just kind of understanding how that work was, was really big for us as well. So actually, you know, um, I'm actually very curious. So when, when it hit 2020, right, um, and with Onboard, because to me, building teams is all about people, right? Um, and 
you know, you are helping other leaders build or bring in leaders, right? And of course you've developed a network, but I'm curious, like what, what's that experience been doing all of this online, right? Like, you know, finding talented individuals, you know, putting that together, right? Like I just, the, the whole process, I mean, I'm sure that just changed in 2020 for you too. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, in some ways it was good. Um, some ways it was learning experience, right? Like as far as like travel, like flying out or like going into the office or whatever, like, you know, we kind of reduce that and, and there's an equity component to that as well, right? Like accessible interviewing and things of that nature. Um, it was really, it was really interesting to see as far, especially from like the people that we worked with around like how they leveled up their kind of like, you know, hiring and things of that nature. Um, um, I, I remember kind of talking to, um, some of the folks over at like, you know, Evidation, right. And then how, um, they're like, actually like, we're, we're good. Like we've, we've actually been like, you know, really tweaking our hiring and onboarding situation. Right. Um, and it's, it's worked out, you know, uh, really well. I mean, and, and as you all know, right, like healthcare was just like, was like the only industry that was actually like, you know, we're actually, we're actually good. Like more right, money yeah. actually like on, on what's going on here. Um, yeah. And so like, that was a, was an interesting kind of, you know, parallel as well. But I, yeah. I, I don't see, I didn't see any like huge downsides to, to the kind of the virtual experience other than needing to learn and everybody kind of giving each other grace. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Get a little bit of forgiveness. It, 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 when you think about it, when you're matching like the companies and the candidates, whatever, you know, there's this, there's probably, I don't know, I'll try to probably say this in the right way, but there's a, there's a concept of like, hey, the company's bad, you know, somehow, like meaning, meaning, um, you know, they haven't done, they haven't, you know, reached out and put in good hiring practices. And so, you know, now they want to react to it, or maybe they have, and they just haven't been good at it, or they have yeah. problems, whatever the reason is. Um, but then you also have the, you know, the candidates and getting them ready, you know, to be successful, like in those, in those jobs. So, you know, I, like a lot of my friends that maybe work in similar space saying it's, you know, it's a two-way street, meaning like, how do you get the candidates to be successful and how do you get the organization, you know, how do you get them to meet each other? Like, do you have a, like, that must be a big piece of what you're trying to do. I, I think Absolutely. Andrea doesn't work with bad organizations. It's, <laughs> it's an upfront client choice. I mean, you got it. I don't know. I'm, I'm like, yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's now, there's definitely like, um, screening that gets done um before like we work together like you know trust and believe like we meet people where they are um on a lot of different things and basically having conversations to know like you know that they that this is an investment this is not going to be easy this is not just kind of like a, a box to check um but but ultimately you know we do you know like assessments to just understand like what's actually happening inside of these organizations and then if there's like a level of like tweaking that and like bolstering that before we actually start sending people um, in like that's that's a big part of what we do as well um, to really just kind of qualify organizations and so we're not for everybody right we're not like a quick win oftentimes um, but you know for the you know for the leadership that understand like why this is such an important investment an important move for like the long term you know aspect and success of the company um, that that's that's definitely a better fit um, and so there is definitely like you know qualifications and rules of engagement um, that we have for companies for sure. Can, can you actually disclose some cool companies that you're working with? If not, no big deal, but I'm just curious. Like, if Yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, so last year um, we had a chance to work with Melissa Hanna at Mami, M-A-H-M-E-E. -E. Um, they are just kind of doing incredible work in the maternal health tech space. In 2019, Serena Williams and Mark Cuban invested in them. Um, they're a backstage capital company. So I'm a mentor and advisor at Backstage Capital, um, which is Arlen Hamilton's, you know, fund, um, that really invest in underrepresented founders. And so there's a couple health um, tech companies over there like Mommy, um, like Nicolette, which is another one around um, maternal health out in LA. Um, so we got a chance to like, you know, really, you know, equip their leadership team, their head of strategic partnerships and um, commercial biz dev. That's a big part of like um, our community as well. It's kind of like the business development sales kind of folks. Um, and then we worked with Rock Health. So like last year, um, you know, I was part of the Rock Health Summit awesome. where we talked about health equity with Dr. Ivor Horn and a number of other cool people. Um, and so actually, we recently just placed um, Katie Drasser, who's the, the new CEO for Rock Health's um, nonprofit and social impact um, arm. I and saw so, that. Yeah. Yep. So that, those are those are some like really cool examples. And then, like I mentioned, we, we work with Dr. Letha Maybank at the AMA 
um, play some senior roles at the Center for Health Equity. And they're just, they're on fire right now, just doing incredible work. And, you know, AMA has like a, I think like Health 2049 or something like that is their like Silicon Valley venture arm as well. So a lot of cool things are happening uh, over there. So those are some of the people that we've been able to work with um, as well. So I'm excited for, for more this year, for sure. Awesome. So, Andre, just uh, maybe one, one more question for me. Um, yeah. As you've been in public health and as you've been observing and not only observing, but influencing, um, given what happened in 2020, where, where do you see, are we, are we going to see significant changes in public health or is this all just going to be swept under a rug somehow over a course <laughs> of five to 10 years, right? Like, I, I really hope not, but I'm just curious your, your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, that's a great question, man. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, um, I'm optimistic that um, the kind of leadership in public, I'm optimistic that this is kind of like a reversal, right? Because oftentimes, like, especially early in my career, it was trying to pull people in traditional public health to like, hey, like technology or like better ways to communicate. This is over here. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll catch up to that. Like, it's a kind of a fad kind of thing. But now, like, especially over the past few years, like we've all seen like new players come in who don't even have backgrounds in healthcare, change the game completely um, and in very valuable ways. And so what I am really excited about though, um, is the, the concepts of public health being infused in a lot of these kind of like uh, future, uh, or future CASA, you know, companies and things of that nature. Um, so, so these days it's less of like trying to bring in the old guard to like, you know, do certain things um, and really starting to see like, you know, what's happening in places like CMS, right? Um, and they're like centers for, for innovation. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I'm really excited for, for what's happening in the, um, with the, the Biden Harris administration is kind of like a resurgence of that kind of stuff. Uh, but now, you know, we're seeing more of these kind of behavioral health companies, right? Like shout out to Solomay Tabebu, like who's been just doing amazing work um, in the mental health and behavioral space. Like I know she's putting on a conference this, uh, this summer that I'm going to be a part of that I'm really excited about. Uh, but like the, the, the kind of gray area that wasn't really like hot, like a couple years back, um, there's so many innovators and leaders that are um, that are jumping into this space right now. And that's what I'm really excited about. It's definitely the leaders, the people who are saying like, you know what, um, like the folks over at Equip Health, right? That are tackling, um, you know, um, like eating disorders and things of that nature, right? Like that, that was like an unmentionable, right? If you all remember like the unmentionables kind of segment at Health 2.0 years ago, like, and now you're Alex, seeing like- Alex Drain, right? I mean, exactly. and she's, still, she's still going, to, we actually need to have Alex on. Um, you should. Anyway, side note, she's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but like the, that's what I'm that's what I'm really excited about, man. It's like this new crop of of leaders and people who are standing up and saying, like, you know what, we're gonna tackle this. Yeah. Uh, from mental health to you know everything else. Um, that's what I'm really excited about. Sounds pretty bullish. Sound bullish. You gotta be. <laughs> Lives at stake, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're you know, I'm I'm the you know, the the timekeeper, which is yep. very unlike me, but um, I, I know Jim, you always ask this question, but I'll just do it for you. The entrepreneurs you've been involved with, you know, innovations for many years as well. What could you tell the entrepreneurs that really do want to change the system, right? Like any sort of advice, any guiding points, any words of wisdom by Andre? Oh, you want me to, to share some yeah, thoughts? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I, 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 Jim, Jim has too many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I would say that it's a, it's a new frontier. Um, you know, if you um, get plugged into uh, the right kinds of community, like, you know, the, I mean, like what we're building here right now is, um, you know, we, we want to plug people into as many resources as possible uh, to change and, and build a more equitable future of health. Um, you know, I have like office hours where I hear so many just amazing stories of people coming up. Um, and so like, it's, it's go for it. Um, do your homework. There's so many resources out there that were not around, like when I was getting started. Um, and like, don't free, don't, don't hesitate to like reach out to people and ask questions. Like there's no stupid question. And, and now we have the resources. There's, you know, Arlen Hamilton doing that kind of stuff with backstage capital, um, you know, what Rock Health is doing, like in, in a new kind of, and I'm really excited for what Katie is going to be bringing to the table um, with rockhealth.org and like expanding the community and expanding access and things of that nature, right? So 
the it's a new frontier um you know ask questions read up um and dive on in awesome awesome andre man that was that was fantastic to connect and reconnect and um uh, and you know allow jim and i suck some of your energy out on the wednesday so <laughs> Yep. Thanks, yep. I mean, it's, it's exciting times, you know, um, but thank you so much, gentlemen, for just like having me here. Um, I can put the shame, the shame bucket down now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can. You're allowed. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, no, if there's any, if, if there's any way to, um, you know, kind of share some more people that would, you know, be great for the show, just let me know. Absolutely. Um, but um, I, I really awesome. appreciate the opportunity, guys. Yeah, no, thank super, you, thanks for all your work. It sounds, yeah. it sounds, like, it sounds noble. Yep.